At GEICO, our community engagement strategy includes our commitment to promoting equity. We believe in supporting the communities where our associates live and work and promoting equity everywhere. We want to help build stronger communities for tomorrow by investing our time and energy today toward meaningful relationships with organizations that support equity, justice, diversity, and inclusion. We call it our insurance plan for the future, and it's a policy we're proud of. We're honored to be a partner and look forward to a positive future together. Good afternoon, and welcome back for our second session of the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project Virtual Summit. If this is your first time joining us today, you missed a great first session, but it will be available to view on demand after today's summit. Again, I am Nicole Austin Hillary, the proud and newly appointed president and CEO for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. As I shared with you earlier, the mission of the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project is to increase awareness of the issues affecting Black women and the community and to mobilize women committed to engaging in these issues and to create positive change while building a connection of women through the So True Network. Session one really sparked a flame in each of us and proved the profound moral courage, resilience, and efforts Black women have made thus far in bringing voting rights laws and voter suppression concerns to the forefront of America. At the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, our assignment is to advance the global Black community by developing leaders, informing policy, and educating the public. Now, of course, the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project is dear to our hearts. It not only honors and celebrates Black women leaders, but helps to cultivate the next generation by multiplying our total efforts and impact. The knowledge and experience displayed on this inspiring panel of Black women leaders will examine these issues and even more. So without further ado, let's get started. But before we begin, I would like to introduce the esteemed chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Thank you again, Nicole, and good afternoon, everyone. We thank each of you for joining us today for a discussion on progressive change and good trouble. I believe we all understand our assignment moving forward. Maybe it is true that we can never quite fill the shoes of Sojourner Truth, who fought during the 19th century for abolition, temperance, civil and women's rights. However, in 2022, we can and we will continue the work and proclaim the truth. We know that when women lead, nothing can stop us. Over the past few years, Black women have reached some of the most important and influential offices in our communities. Black women just don't break glass ceilings. We lift as we climb without ceasing. As Black women continue to intentionally create and occupy necessary space, raise their voices, and rise to influential leadership positions around the world, we encourage inspire, support, and uphold one another as sisters. In public policy and corporate arenas, we will be heard. In the Capitol and our respective districts, our offices, and in the boardrooms, each woman here today is an example of how it can be done and a testament to what happens when women are truthful to the cause and lead the way. They give permission to the next generation of leaders to be unapologetically fierce, strong, brave, and a good trouble, a necessary trouble, as women like Sojourner Truth did before us. I am honored to participate in this afternoon's session with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation as we engage in this critical conversation about the power we hold when women lead. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the chairwoman of the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project and an incredible colleague and friend serving New York's 9th District, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark. Let me start by thanking our chairwoman, uh, the president and CEO of the foundation, 
Ms. Hillary, uh, and all of you for joining us this afternoon. Congresswoman Beatty has been a phenomenal leader of the Congressional Black Caucus, and she leads as only women do with force and fierceness. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. It is truly my pleasure to serve as the chair of the Sojourn Truth Legacy Project. This project is a means to connect Black women, collectively focus upon our concerns, support each other in our respective areas of expertise as we all strive to improve our global community and raise new leaders. Each year we set aside time to celebrate and highlight the amazing legacy, history, and continued work of Black women leaders who have dedicated their careers and often their lives to eliminating systemic barriers and ensuring equity for all. Today, we have convened here virtually to celebrate the rise in Black women's political leadership and her morning session was nothing short of powerful. This morning, we heard from a panel of exceptional Black women, our sisters from the Congressional Black Caucus as they discuss the continued fight to, in protecting voting rights. They also highlighted the need and the role of grassroots organizers and the steps legislators have taken to protect our right to vote. It is a conversation that left me invigorated and fired up. I can't wait to hear what our panel of incredible leaders in both the political and corporate realms have for us this afternoon. In this second and final session of the summit, our focus centers on celebrating Black women mayors and Black women in C-suite roles, highlighting their leadership and how they are influencing national trends and are in turn how they are inspiring other women to lead. We are here during Women's History Month to celebrate the amazing legacy, history, and continued work of Black women leaders who have dedicated their careers to eliminating systemic barriers and ensuring equity for us all. Every day that I live, I truly believe that I'm creating a legacy. And I want young Black women with beautiful brown skin to know that you don't have to ask permission. If you work hard, get your education, and reach for success, you can do and be anything. Today, I'm honored to be the moderator of a powerful panel of Black women leading and creating change to secure a more equitable nation for the next generation of leaders. Today's discussion is long overdue. For far too long, women in the United States have been denied equality, and this pandemic has only worsened that, uh, that inequality, especially for women of color. But one thing about women, we will fight and we will not back down. We know that this country's soul and moral morality rests on the shoulders of women like us. And it has, and it has been that way for centuries. And I'm proud to stand today with these amazing black women leaders to give you a glimpse of how their inspiring leadership galvanizes other women to lead. While America's most prestigious corporate boards and spaces of power continue to be filled by primarily white men, Black women are climbing the charts. Over the past few years, Black women have reached some of the most critical and influential offices in our communities. During today's session, we will celebrate the achievements of Black women and discuss how their leadership continues to influence national trends. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's panel. First, we have Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, who proudly serves as mayor of the city of Mount Vernon, New York. Mayor Patterson Howard is the first female mayor in the city of Mount Vernon's history and the first woman of color, black woman, elected mayor in Westchester County. So glad that you're here with us, Mayor Patterson Howard. Glad to be here, Congresswoman Clark. 
Wonderful. I also want to welcome at this time, Mayor Veronica Williams, who proudly serves as mayor of Opelika, Florida. Veronica is a longtime resident of Opelika and believes in people over politics. She is striving each day towards helping to ensure transparency in local government and make Opelika a first-rate city. Thank you for joining us, Mayor Williams. Thank you so much. I am so delighted to be here, Representative Clark, and I am so ready for this overdue discussion. Thank you for joining us. We are also joined by former Chief Diversity Officer of Raytheon and Thought Leader, Ms. Marie Silla Dixon. Marie, Good night. <laughs> Marie is incredibly knowledgeable on DEI, policy, technology, telecom, and its impact on underserved communities and communities of color. She is also a proud member of the Washington Technology Institute Board. Please join me in welcoming Marie. I'm honored to be here, Congresswoman. Thank you for having this discussion today. And to round out this amazing group is Telva Magruder, Chief Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Officer for General Motors. Telva's career at General Motors spans over 20 outstanding years, starting as an electrical engineer where she worked her way up through the ranks. She is a member of the GM Inclusion Advisory Board and committed to decreasing disparities in economics, healthcare, education, and justice in Black and underrepresented communities. Thank you for being here, Telva Magruda. I am excited to hear such a meaningful dialogue. So let's get started. Good, very excited. Thank you, Representative Clark. Well, let me start with a question for you, Telva. Reflect, if you will, for us on your experience is as uh, not only a woman in leadership, but a Black woman in leadership. Have there been uh, any distinct moments when you realized that your background made you uniquely equipped for the job at hand? You know, it's um, after so many years at uh, such a great company, you have a lot of memories. Um, and you have a lot of memories of things that were more difficult than they needed to be. And you have memories of those moments when you said, yeah, you know, I'm supposed to be here. And, and people need to understand that I'm, I'm here for a reason. And I even need to embrace that. And one of the times that that happened for me was when we were in the middle of a really big problem. Most of my career I spent manufacturing as an engineer and as an engineering leader, um, leading groups of um, uh, technicians, um, maintenance team members, and also groups of engineers. And, and at this time I was leading a group of engineers and we were in the middle of trying to solve a problem that could really bring us to our knees if we didn't solve it. Um, we were launching a new vehicle and we had a piece of equipment that was failing soon after it had been installed. And um, several engineers and engineering leaders had, had worked on this problem and hadn't been able to come up with a solution. And, um, and they called me and they said, hey, Talva, we need you to come in and, and, and take this role. Um, and, and oh, by the way, we're in the middle of a huge problem. <laughs> And at first I was thinking, uh, so you called me because you're in the middle of a huge problem that you don't think you can solve. But then I got to the next thought, which was, but you called me because you're in the middle of a problem that you don't think you can solve. And I was able to go in and, and meet the team and understand what they were working on. And it was a, it was a huge electrical mechanical problem and, um, and encourage them to, to bring in the help they needed. A lot of times, when you're working on teams of very experienced talent, technical talent, men, right? They don't necessarily believe that they, you know, need the external help. They just feel like sometimes they're missing something or, or you know, the company that we're working with isn't necessarily aligned with where they need to be. But as it turned out, we were missing something. And I was able to come in as the technical leader and look at what they had going on and said, we don't have the expertise we need. Let's bring in the expertise we need and let's use our expertise to challenge their thinking and make sure we end up in the right place. And, and that's what we did. And I'll never forget the day, you know, after we, you know, spent the, the weeks it took to get the solution in place. And I talked to the, our vice president 
um, over manufacturing engineering. And he said, you know, we needed someone like you that could come in and step back and really figure out how to solve this problem. And, and, and I knew that before I walked into his office, but having him say that really helped me understand that I'm here for a reason. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing uh, that experience with us. Let me ask you, Marie, what challenges have you faced working in such a male dominated field? What advice would you give to young black women struggling to overcome those barriers and break into male dominated fields? Congresswoman, thank you for that question. Um, we know that for women and specifically, you know, black women, um, it can be a very, very tough environment um, to be in a male dominated field. And we know that oftentimes, especially for black people and black women, we're expected to do less and often um, with less resources than our white counterparts. And we're also expected to uh, perform um, and, 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 and show up twice as, as great. And that's not right. Um, what advice I would give to especially black women and young black women right now is I encourage you to really hone in on your craft. I also encourage you to do uh, relationship building and networking um, to really seek out mentors and sponsors in an organization. And I can tell you, there are people that are rooting um, on you in an organization um, to help, out, help you out. And what I would also say is that when you're seeking out mentors or sponsors, um, and I can say this from my experience, some of my mentors or sponsors didn't necessarily look like me. Um, some of them were also men um, who ended up being champions and allies uh, to really help and uplift me in my career. And if it wasn't for um, some of these allies and champions showing up on me, I don't think I would have progressed as far as I did. So I, the, also the, the, the second piece that I would say um, is to also um, speak up for yourself. Um, you know, make sure that you, if, if, if there is something happening um, or if you see something, um, to, to you are your own advocate and to use your voice because you have more power um, than you think. Well, thank you for that answer. And that really, uh, I think, uh, has some key nuggets in it. I hope that our audience is, take, is taking notes. Uh, I want to turn now to our elected women, the mayors, the executives of their respective uh, cities. Uh, despite being 7.8% of the population, Black women are less than 5% of office holders elected to statewide executive offices, Congress, and state legislatures. On the other hand, Black women now hold the top executive posts in eight of the 100 most populous cities matching their population of the United States population. In reaching this milestone, how do both of you confront the duality of both progress and continued inequity? And how does this achievement of representation in local leadership impact the future of state representation uh, in the Senate? And do you feel the pressures of this victory during your term? And are these any intentional, are there any intentional steps that you take to ensure that your term as mayor helps to defy historical biases of women in leadership? Now, I know that's a mouthful, but we'd love to hear from you ladies. Why don't we start with uh, Mayor Sean Patterson? Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Clark. So definitely as the first woman um, to hold this office and then the first black woman to even hold it in the county and probably one of three in the state as, as a mayor, um, it comes with a lot of pressure. Uh, people oftentimes underestimate 
what you can do and they discount you. Um, but that's why you have to show up. You have to show up prepared. You always have to make sure that you're building a team that complements um, your strengths as well as will uh, take care of the challenges that you might have. You can't be expected to know everything. Uh, and I think that's a trap oftentimes that we put ourselves in. When we finally get an opportunity to lead, people want to make us feel like we're supposed to be an expert in everything. And no one is ever an expert in everything. We work as Black women, we work on our competencies, we work so much on our credentials. Um, and when we're in these offices, we have to make sure that we're also working on our courage because it takes courage to lead in these days. Oftentimes as Black women, we are given the opportunity opportunity to lead at these levels after everyone else has failed. They'll say, oh, well, you know, the white man had it, the black man had it, they didn't do it. So we might as well give her a chance. And, and I heard that a lot. Well, no one else has done it. Give her a chance. Let her come in. And, and I think as Black women in various leadership positions, whether it's in public or private, we're seen as the cleanup women, woman. You have to come in and you have to fix what has been neglected for so long and you have to do an excellent job with very little resources. And so we take on this role as a superwoman. Um, and, and that's something that we do as Black women anyhow, whether you're a mother, a PTA person, a mayor, uh, someone in corporate America, and we have to be careful because that superwoman cape can turn into a noose when we extend ourselves and we put the level of pressure that we often put on ourselves. It's one thing for the community and those around us to put pressure on us. It's another thing for us to put the level of pressure on us that we often do, um, because that can cause our demise, whether we're overworking. Yes, we show up early, we stay late, we work on weekends, um, and we try and meet the needs of our community because we feel it. We feel it in our heart and in our gut. And oftentimes we're um, faced with feeling fit failure. We're faced with um, fear of failure and saying, if I don't do this well, then another black woman will not have the opportunity to come behind me. And so we push ourselves to the limit. And so, you know, some of the things that I do um, that are intentional to make sure that I'm successful, A, is I pray, B, I surround, I make sure that I hire for the position um, and not for the hookup because it's, it's not about your friends, it's about who can get the job done. Um, because if we don't get this job done, no one will ever get another opportunity to do it. And so it's just really, really critical. We have to set goals and we have to make what our goals are clear and reach them. And you've already said it, partnerships are critical. Public-private partnerships are, are critical across all sectors to make sure that the work is getting done. We can't do this alone. We can't make anyone um, put us in a position where we feel like we're doing it alone. We have to reach back, reach down inside of ourselves, tap into our resilience and grit, and and reach out for help at all times. So, so Mayor Veronica Williams, give us your insights into uh, the challenges of, of the leadership that you embody uh, as a mayor. Well, first, let me just say, I am so thrilled to be here amongst all this talent, this uh, the talented 10th of Black women. We're living in such a, a phenomenal time right now where uh, Black women are stepping up to the plate all over, not just you know federal or government, but also local leadership. And, you know, this is, I want to preface this discussion by, this seems to be my new quote by Representative Val Demings, who once said that uh, it takes Black women seven years to decide if we're going to run, if we're going to do something, but it takes the white man one day to walk into Brooks Brothers and put on a suit and say, I look good, I'm running for governor. And so because of that, we as Black women have to step up, step out, and say to ourselves that we are ready to take the mantle. I know in my city, I am not the first Black woman. I'm actually the third Black woman to be the mayor. Um, Helen Miller was our first mayor of the great city of Opelika. And um, following in our footsteps, in their footsteps, just making sure that we continue to hold the mantle. We are one of two Black cities left in Miami. And so making sure that 
when we talk about local residents, we touch our residents. We touch grandma, grandpa, and our cousins and everyone. So how do we ensure that as Black women, we're doing it right? As Black women, we're constantly judged. I know I am constantly. You have to get it right at all costs. Um, and it, it sometimes it becomes cumbersome. Not only that, I can tell you, I also have a job. I'm also a vice principal of a high school. So um, just juggling all of that as well makes us say, wait a minute, we can do what we put our minds to. And I love, love, love this day and age that we're living in right now because Black women are showing up and showing out. And we're also walking into the room when we see other leaders and we say to ourselves, hey, girl, you got this. I know you can do it. And just making sure that we network and we're providing the assistance and just the empowering words that we need. I love when my sisters, you know, through just throw me in text and say, you're doing a phenomenal job. I, you're, you're, how, how great is that when we build and lift each other up? Because so, for so long, we've been known to, to tear each other down. And I think we're living in this age. And I'm so excited because I know on the dais, I always say I'm doing this for the next girl that looks like me in 10 years. She's not going to wait till she's 40 to say, I'm going to run. She's going to be able to decide at 26 that she's going to run and not have to decide, hey, I think I'm going to wait. I think I'm going to wait. No, you're going to do it. And if you don't succeed the first time, you're going to succeed again. And we all have your back. So I know that, you know, we want to make sure that we're all together, that we're all, no matter where we are, um, in New York and in California, that we are telling each other, congratulations, you got this, whatever you need, I'm here for you. If you come through Miami, I'm gonna lay the red carpet out just for you, my sister. So thank you so much for, for adding that perspective to this conversation for our entire panel. I'm going to ask you one question and have each of you provide your unique lens in responding. As Black women, we face unique barriers to workplace uh, and workforce participation and higher education, such as misogyny, patriarchy, and racism. Black women face disparities in financial resources, which was pointed out by Mayor Patterson Howard, and biases about leadership and what leadership should look like in this country. What are the biggest obstacles that Black women confront as they look to advance in their leadership roles? And what did you pull upon to get past those barriers? And I'm going to start uh, um, with uh, Marie Silla. Thank you for that question. Um, so I think the, the, the biggest challenge is that a lot of these institutions and organizations um, were not created with our best interest at the time, and that some of the barriers and obstacles really are having to navigate a culture, again, in an environment that was not set up. Um, and this can be very challenging, um, especially for Black women when you're looking for role models and leadership, and there is a lack of role models. Um, however, I'm confident that in the, in the future and soon that you, you are seeing you know, more Black women um, uh, growing and, and taking on leadership roles, uh, whether it's more mayors um, and more Black women getting elected to statewide offices and more Black women becoming CEOs. So that in itself will help um, really uh, a psyche to, so that other young Black women can see women that look like themselves um, in leadership. And I think that is really, really critical. Um, I also think when we look at, you know, um, some of the obstacles, and I think um, one of the mayors said it as well, is that as Black women, we do have a, a superwoman mentality and we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves and one of the things that I would say is just have self-compassion and grace um, when it comes to giving uh, ourselves um, some uh, self-compassion, um, because I think it is so critical, especially right now, um, that we do that um, because we are 
uh, you know, outperforming. We're not only taking care of things in the boardroom or, um, you know, with an organization, but we're also, a lot of Black women are the ones, our primary caregivers when it comes to children or parents and really are the backbone of the family. Um, so what I would say right now, especially to my sisters out there, is give yourself some um, self-compassion. Absolutely. Uh, and let me ask uh, Mayor uh, Sean Patterson Howard to respond. So, you know, definitely the same um, thing that Ms. Silla said is we, we have to give ourselves, um, we have to give ourselves grace. And in order to get into the C-suite position, oftentimes when people are hiring, they're looking for themselves in you. And so <laughs> it's, it's the like me syndrome. And I've, I've dealt with that over and over again. They're saying, you know, your credentials are great, but can I go to golf with you? Can I hang out after work? Or are you the person who I would invite over my house? Um, is my path similar to yours? Can I relate to how you were raised or the community you grew up in? And none of that ever has anything to do with the credentials. But when you're dealing with boards of directors who are hiring CEOs, they want to see if that candidate, they're attracted to people who are like them. And so when it comes to corporations, until we get more people of color, more women sitting on these different boards and fortune, not just 500, but 100 boards, Boards, it becomes more challenging for those boards to see our qualities because they can't see past how we are not like them. It's the same thing in the not-for-profit community. I was the third African-American woman in the nation hired as a CEO of the YMCA. And once again, as we went through our African-American and our multicultural executive development program, those were the things that we really had to work on is how to push through that barrier of that like me syndrome so that they could see your qualifications, that they could see your grit, that they could see your success. And, and the one thing that they told me over and over again is allow them to see, you know, take what they see as your disadvantages and turn them into strategic advantages. And so we have to push past the like me. And, and so even as a woman of color, uh, there are times where I put cornrows in my hair. And, and that makes it even harder sometimes for people to see me because then I even look less like them. Um, so the like me syndrome is very hard to pass by if you didn't go to the colleges they went to, if you didn't live in the neighborhoods that they lived in. It's hard for people to see you in positions. So like me is something that is very difficult to push through. But um, that's something that we have to train our, our women and our young women for is really pushing past that barrier because it is probably one of the greatest barriers that we do face. Thank you so much for that, Mayor Patterson. Uh, let me uh, ask uh, Ms. Telva Magruda, uh, what are the biggest obstacles Black women confront as they look to advance in leadership roles in your experience? Uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman, for that question. You know, one of one of the biggest barriers we discuss, and, and all of the examples given so far are absolutely fantastic. The like me syndrome, and 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 recognizing what's around you. But one of the biggest barriers is really uh, obtaining the right opportunities. You know, having someone that can that can help you understand to some extent how you know move. Moving to different levels in an organization it doesn't just happen because you work hard. It happens because there are particular roles that you need to take on, things you may need to do that you may not want to do, that you may not think are the best things for you to do. And, and, and you need someone um, or multiple someones, mentors, in some cases, sponsors, and in some cases, um, colleagues that have, that have done it before or, or, or you know, external coaching to help you see these are the kinds of roles that you need to take if what you desire to do is to move up that corporate ladder. And a really key example in a, in a large corporation is like a profit and loss role, for example. So a lot of times women, women aren't tracked for P&L roles and, and Black women aren't tracked for P&L roles. Those are, those are seen as some of the most challenging roles. They're some of the 
they're the ones that, that the profit of that public company and, and the example I'm giving uh, depends upon. And, and it's something that's not talked about very much. You know, just like in our regular lives, you know, you go through life being a woman, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're having an experience that every woman goes through and no one ever told you it was going to be like this, right? And it's like that in the corporate world as well. You know, it's, it's oh, so you mean if I really want to move up the ladder, I need to move into P&L. And so making relationships, building relationships, varied relationships with people that look like you and people that don't look like you, people that have your same expertise and people that don't have your same expertise, people that have different perspectives is so critical so that you can gain the insights you need to land yourself in the right positions or to build relationships to help to help uh, to help guide your progress. So really important to build relationships. And the best thing I'll say about building relationships, and one thing that's really important for us as Black women is that we'll, sometimes we'll tend not to want to do that because it's hard. We'll tend to say, they don't get me. They don't understand me. They'll never understand me. But fundamentally, if they don't understand you a little bit, then they don't know how to advocate for you. They don't know how to give you the insight that you need. And so, you know, we really have to lean into that and build the relationships and, and decrease that gap of lack of understanding and eliminate excuses fundamentally. Just eliminate excuses that, you know, where people might be able to say, you know, well, she's not like us. Well, the more you build that relationship, the more people tend to understand that. My skill set is absolutely it. And building that relationship in a positive way allows that barrier to come down so that you can move through it. So um, that's, a, that's a key thing to think about is build the relationship so you can see the path. Well, thank you so much for that insight, uh, Telva. Let me uh, ask uh, Mayor Veronica Williams, what are the biggest obstacles in your experience that Black women confront as they look to advance in leadership roles? Well, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room sometimes become the crab in the bucket syndrome. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. I know that I've had some experiences um, where, and, and again, this is the elephant in the room. Sometimes the black men are the ones that seem to, because as black women, we are so black girl magic right now that you know our, our 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 steamship is going and sometimes it becomes a little threatening to black men and that really is the elephant in the room because we want to make sure that we are you know always at all times celebrated and then ourselves we are, are sometimes we become our own worst enemy because I always say there's enough out here for us to eat. And when I say eat, I mean politically, we're not even remotely breaking the barriers. I mean, it does feel like it, but there are so many things that we can do to break those barriers. And, you know, I tell people all the time when people are, when Black women are running campaigns, do you know how much money it takes to run a campaign? You know, we have to make sure at all costs that we understand, we totally, truly understand what it is to build each and falling for the crab in the bucket syndrome. Well, thank you again. We've gotten some words of wisdom from Mayor uh, Veronica. And let me uh, now move us to one final question. Uh, some may see it as trivial, but as black women, we know that appearance has always been uh, one of those sort of elusive qualifications for advancement. So let's talk about Black women and our appearance. In June of 2019, California made headlines for becoming the first state in to outlaw the racial discrimination of individuals based on natural hairstyles the Create a Respectful and Open Workplace for Natural Hair Act states. In a society in which hair has historically been one of the more uh, determining factors of a person's race and whether they were a second-class citizen, hair remains a proxy for race. Therefore, hair discrimination 
targeting hairstyles associated with race is racial discrimination. And since 2019, 10 states have passed the Crown Act signaling progress in safeguarding diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And I'm happy to announce that the House of Representatives just last week, last week Friday, passed uh, the House version of the Crown Act. We are now waiting for the U.S. Senate uh, to act. So to each of you, uh, I just want to get your response. How have you contended with hair discrimination either in the C-suites or in political leadership? So I guess I can start with uh, Ms. Magruder. Yes, ma'am. So over 20 years ago, I decided to go natural. And, and well before that, I decided not to dye my hair, right? And, and um, I tell you what, <laughs> the, the number of questions that I get and the amount of advice I get about how, how, how bad those decisions were is, has been absolutely ridiculous. But it was all on the front end right? Because a lot of people felt they needed to help me and, and, and tell me that what I was doing wasn't necessarily the best for my long-term career, um, you know, on both counts. And, and how do I deal with it? You know, and, I, and I've actually had people say, you know, you will not get the next job, right? Because you've made this, this choice. And the way I've chosen to deal with it is keep going, keep going. You know, I made the decisions because that's what I needed to be at my best, to be the strongest me, you know? And, and for me personally, doing my hair every day, that wasn't it, right? And, and for me personally, worrying about making sure it was dyed before it started to, you know, gray again, that wasn't it. And so I had to sit and say, you know what? I'm willing to accept the risk that people will discriminate against me because of what I've done. But frankly, you know, I need to look inside of myself and not be afraid to shine not be afraid to shine and help people get to know me and, and how I can work with them and we can do great things together. Awesome, awesome. Let me, uh, um, let me I'm, add. Fortunately. I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Telma. No, all set. I'm just saying, I was, I was just gonna say, you know, unfortunately you can't change everyone's mind, but what you can do is work to work against the energy. And that's what I do. Awesome. Uh, Mayor Veronica Williams, your experience. You know, I, I think it's um, the fact that we're even having this conversation. Um, but I will tell you, <laughs> you know, like I said earlier, I am a vice principal at a um, high school in a low socioeconomic neighborhood. So all the girls look like me, basically. And I walk around and I talk to them and I said, man, you girls, uh, I love y'all because they are natural, 100%, you know, and of course it might be a wig, but when I take that wig off, I'm rocking an Afro or some puffs. And I absolutely love the energy that black women are bringing with our hair. We're diverse. We're all diverse. And I think about when we all see those pictures from the seventies and you see that we're like right back into that to that same space. The fact that, you know, we have Fortune 500 companies or just anyone discriminating on hair is absolutely ludicrous to me. And I think that as black women, we have to make sure that it does not happen and support all bills that come out. Um, but again, I can tell you the future looks bright because when I walk my campus, those girls are unstoppable with their natural hair. Wonderful. And uh, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Howard, how would you uh, speak to this experience? I heard you begin a conversation about wearing your hair in braids. Yeah, I, I stopped perming my hair about 10 years ago and I blow it out. But in the summer, I love to wear it wavy and big and huge. Um, and for the first time in about 38 years, I put braids in last summer. And I've been rocking my braids um, regularly and, and I put them up in a bun. I twist them up all different types of hairstyle. We'll put jewelry in it. And, you know, one of the news commentators in the area 
told me that he loved my braids, but he said that someone asked him after an interview, I like that man, but she need to take those braids out because those braids, you know, is, I like her hair the other way. So look, um, me putting my hair in braids, I didn't realize that it was going to be a thing. You know, my deputy police commissioner got braids. One of the women from the DA's office got braids. And all of a sudden I saw a lot of women in our area who have been either natural but without braids or, or perming their hair, go and get braids. Sometimes it's easier, it's a protective style, and we cannot allow our hair to cause us to die. You know, we if you need to lose weight, if you need to swim, if you need to jog, bike, run, braids are good, natural hair is good. It allows you to focus more on your health than worrying about, are my curls gonna fall? Is it gonna get puffy before I have a, a, a press conference or something? So I can't die for my hair. I'm, I'm riding my bike. My braids are going back in soon and the weather's getting ready to be get warm. So I'm gonna be out there walking and running and riding so that I could focus on my health. And my quality of work does not change because of how I wear my hair, um, but I'm liberated and I'm gonna rock it out. Wonderful. And let me ask Ms. Marie Sil uh, Silla Dixon for her experience. First of all, I'm just going to say to the women of the Congressional Black Caucus, thank you for championing the Crown Act in the House. This is huge. Um, I actually wore my hair in braids and in locks for a while. It's straight now, but just like um, Mayor Howard was saying, um, I normally wear my hair in braids, but it's, 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 it's out right now. And I will tell you, uh, the first time that I came to an organization, I showed up and I had my locks, my braids in, and I can't tell you how many young Black women emailed me saying, thank you. This is the first time that we've seen a woman in the C-suite with natural hair or with braids. And that seeing themselves and seeing that image, it just, it was, it was incredible. And I'll also tell you, you know, I, I wear my hair natural at times as well. And I also, you know, my daughter who's 10 years old wears braids, uh, wears her hair natural. And that's the image that I want to send um, to my daughter and other women. You can wear your hair whatever way you like. You are beautiful no matter what way you wear your hair. Um, and just, you know, that is the outer. That is not what is inside you as a person and who you are as a person. So what I would say is, um, do you wear whatever you want to wear, whatever hairstyle? Um, but just again, thank you for that Crown Act. It means so much to all of us. Well, thank you, uh, Marisa Dixon. And let me thank all of our panelists. And I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the Honorable Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey, who is the lead sponsor on the Crown Act and worked so hard to navigate this legislation through the House of Representatives. There was some backlash, let us be clear, but we stood firm as members of the House of Representatives and the me measure has passed the House. It is now up to each and every one of us and black women can get this done to, uh, to, to compel the Senate to act as well so that our president, Joe Biden, can sign this legislation into law. Because indeed, uh, uh, discrimination based on hair texture, hair style is indeed racial discrimination. So let me thank you all. Let me thank our panelists for really uh, providing such insight and wisdom today. I think that our audience has been treated to a lesson a uh, quick lesson on women, women's leadership in both the C-suites and in our political leadership across this nation. Let me thank uh, all of you for joining the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project uh, as we commemorate Women's History Month. Thank you all so very much. And we could not end this event without acknowledging the legacy of Sojourner Truth. Enjoy her history as shared by my sister, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. Let me thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and Chairwoman Yvette Clark for welcoming me to do this historical journey about Sojourner Truth. Born Isabella Bumphrey in 1797, she received her freedom in 1826. 
27. And as well, she began her journey. And frankly, that is the kind of journey we had in the United States Congress to fight for the first African-American woman, slave woman, to be placed in the United States Capitol. Sojourner Truth was the very first. It was not an easy journey. I looked at the legacy of statements and years. We started in 1997 when I rose to say that the suffragette statute that is now in the rotunda that had not yet been brought up from the basement should not come up unless Sojourner Truth would be placed right there. We did not have a statute yet. We did not have legislation. But C. Dolores Tucker was fighting to ensure that Sojourner Truth could be recognized. And I'm so glad that I was tapped to join her in this effort. But ultimately, I introduced the legislation to establish a statute honoring Sojourner Truth that would come to the United States Congress. I'm glad to be joined in the United States Senate by Senator Hillary Clinton and Senator Arlen Specter. And so way into 2006, we finally were able to celebrate the passage of legislation that would allow this bus, this statute to be received. Let, let me be very clear. There was no other statute of a black woman ever. And so, except for a head, I believe, that might have been here, or a pitcher, a pitcher uh, was here. Shirley Chisholm's pitcher was not here. That is the power of what happens when black women come together, the power of this Sojourner Truth Project that is led by the Honorable Yvette Clark. We are making a difference. Our task is still not done. Sojourner Truth must be placed as I'd always dreamed, as we should want to have, right where the suffragettes are in the rotunda. And that's the challenge that I hope you'll all accept. That history that is placed now in the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and the histories and archives of the Congressional Black Caucus and that of all of us who work so hard to make this happen. She is deserving of that. She fought in two ways, to fight against slavery and to ensure the rights of women. So during the truth, born Isabella Bumfrey, but she truly did tell us the truth and she sojourned across the land to speak freedom, to speak power, to speak equality and justice. Sojourner Truth and this project, Sojourner Truth, will continue to be a giving project to give strength to young women and to bring generations of women together. And particularly those of us, African-American women, the history of our strength is vested in Sojourner Truth. Ain't I a woman? Wow, what an incredible, incredible afternoon. One, I want to thank Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee for recounting for us and anchoring us, centering us in the legacy of Sojourner Truth and what she has done to raise the consciousness of Black women's contributions in the United States of America. And what an incredible panel. I'm absolutely inspired by the experiences of the amazing women that shared with us this afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us in this insightful discussion, highlighting the outstanding work of black women who have dedicated their careers to eliminating systemic barriers and ensuring equality for all. To Congresswoman Beatty, Congresswoman Sewell, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, Moore and Williams. We appreciate your perspective, leadership, and above all, friendship. Thank you. And to our distinguished panel who embody exceptional Black women's leadership, thank you for an engaging and edifying discussion this afternoon. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors once again, supporting today's summit, Geico, Philip Morris International, Salesforce, and the League of Women Voters. Thank you for partnering with us. Your dedication to and commitment to these essential conversations are pivotal as we celebrate Black women's rise in political leadership throughout today's summit. I would be remiss also if I didn't thank the staff at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, the women who work on the Sojourner Truth Legacy Project and the staff of my office who have made it possible for us to come together today.
Now, before you return to your day, I have three requests I'd like to make of you. This may sound very familiar to those of you who joined us earlier today, but it still applies. So let's go. Number one, we want your feedback. Please scan the QR code to complete, complete a, a survey of today's event. Your insight and input help us meet your needs for future events. So we wanna make sure that we hear from you. Number two, I'll start with a question. Are you following connecting and friending the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, AKA the C CBCF now? If the answer is yes, thank you very much. But if it's no, don't worry, here's your chance. Make sure that you stay in the know about what's going on at the CBCF by following them on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and friending us on Facebook. But remember to include the official event hashtag. So true. That's S-O-T-R-U. Stay in the conversation. And finally, number three, spread the word. Today's summit will be available on demand here on this virtual platform starting tomorrow. Please encourage anyone you know who couldn't attend to check it out. Also save the date for the CBCF's Policy for the People 2022 Health Equity Summit on May 12th. And stay tuned for more information as the date approaches. Today's summit has been nothing short of powerful. And thank you all for joining us today. And we hope to see you at the next CBCF event. Thank you.